Okay, good morning, everyone. So we're just welcoming uh, people into the webinar now. Uh, welcome to the Trade Policy Research Forum. Um, I'm Ben Shepard, one of the co-founders. I'm here with my other uh, co-founder, Hannah Norberg. Uh, we're an online uh, forum that's been going since, uh, I think, October 2020. And what we aim to do is to bring people together from around the world to talk about different aspects of trade policy and also to bring people together from different parts of the profession. So we have economists, we have lawyers, we have political scientists, we have policy specialists, and we have practitioners. And we try to develop links among all of these different sorts of people. Our objective is to try and recreate something a little bit like a brown bag lunch um, that many of us are familiar with from grad school, either for people who are like myself, a long time out of grad school and no longer have access uh, to such things, or people who are in environments uh, where that's not common practice. Um, so we have a very friendly uh, setting. Uh, during the webinar, please feel free to post questions and comments in the chat box that you can see on the right-hand part of your screen. Alternatively, uh, you can post them in the Q&A function of Zoom. And we have a great webinar today. We're talking about something uh, very topical, which is trade in uh, fisheries. Let me emphasize before we get going that we've got two great presenters who Hannah will introduce in a moment, um, but they're both here out of the goodness of their hearts uh, and they are speaking in a strictly personal perspective. Um, so this is not either a presentation by the OECD or the Commonwealth Secretariat, it's a presentation by two uh, uh, human beings uh, speaking with their personal views. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let me hand over to Hannah to introduce the session. Thank you so much for that, Ben. Yes, human beings, not AI yet. Um, <laughs> so welcome everybody, it's so good to see you, so good to see so many of our friends and the attendees. Hey Greg and hey Sarah and some new people here too, even you, you and Yvonne. Um, and, uh, Everybody is so welcome to be here today to take part in this conversation is what this is. It's important for, for Ben and me that this is an interactive conversation. So um, please use the chat box and why don't you kick it off by introducing yourselves in the chat box or at least just let us know where you're calling in from today because that's always so much fun. Um, and so uh, yes, and as always, we are connecting here on Zoom, but also on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And we have a brand new, really cool website um, where we will upload this recording. So by staying on here, you all know that we are recording this and you're staying on. Um, and it's all right to reach out to Claire and Radhika uh, afterwards um, to continue your conversation if there's anything that you wish to know. Now, you all know this who have been here before with us that it's it's a very friendly uh, environment and we really, really appreciate conversations. So we want to hear from you. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump on here and I'm going to introduce you to Claire, who is the uh, head of fisheries and of the aqu aquaculture unit at the OECD. She's going to talk a little bit about their 2022 report. Everything about that is going to be at the end. And the references to the report is in the presentation I checked, and we will be posting the presentations also afterwards. You guys can just kick back and relax. And then we're looking um, after her presentation is done, we're lucky enough to have Radhika Kumar who is an advisor um, at the, uh, of infrastructure policy at the Commonwealth Secretariat to do the commenting here today. Uh, and as always, Ben and I are just our your happy sidekicks and we will summarize, try to summarize the questions as they go, or um, if Claire and Radhika want to uh, answer them on the fly, that's also all right. And I see that people are jumping into the chat box. I really appreciate that. So without further ado, I'm giving it over to Claire. Thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you, Ben, as well, for this uh, invitation to discuss what has been a relatively hot topic uh, for the past few months and even the past few days as countries are starting to ratify um, the WTO fisheries agreements that was uh, concluded June last year. Uh, and in fact, what I'll show you that it's been a non and off hot trade policy issue for over two decades. So we're, I'm really happy to be here discussing some results um, finally. Um, as it's been um, sort of long overdue. Um, 
As you can see on this slide, the stated objective of eliminating environmentally harmful support um, to fisheries actually goes back at least to the early 2000s. Um, when the WTO was invited to clarify its rule on subsidies in relation with the concerns of developing countries, but also in relation with environmental uh, consequences. So the Doha mandate is seen by, by many as the start of this conversation that we are um, having today. At the same time, um, the FAO adopted the International Plan of Action against illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which people refer to as IUU fishing which kind of broad policy focus on the issue of unsustainable fishing, or at least certain types of particularly harmful uh, fishing practices. And so this kind of came together in the, 20, uh, in the 2005 Hong Kong Declaration, which um, calls for forbidding certain types of subsidies that encourage overcapacity and overfishing. Uh, of course, always considering the need for special and differential treatment for, for developing countries. And in parallel, uh, targets were adopted uh, in different uh, setups that with that same objective. So by the parties to the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, uh, initially in the AISHI targets, and very recently in the coming Montreal Agreement that has specific targets on environmentally harmful uh, subsidies that refer to, to fisheries. And in the SDG framework, uh, where target 14.6 really sets um, the negotiation mandate of the WTO around the elimination of subsidies that encourage overfishing, overcapacity, and those that support IUU fishing. And it's on that that WTO members have been focusing their attention um, since then. And it's on that that they have begun to deliver with the June 2022 agreement on, on fisheries agreements. Interestingly, in parallel, a number of bilateral and regional trade agreements have already adopted a number of disciplines on, on fishing subsidies. Um, the latest ones were the, the trade agreements between the UK and New Zealand and UK and Australia. But before that, the CPTPP and the USMCA also had some, uh, some included. Um, so, this idea of eliminating harmful fisheries support obviously is a trade topic in that it deals with subsidies and it certainly has the potential to influence fisheries trade and competition. But it's not only or even maybe not mainly a trade issue as the harmfulness that is being dealt with is not harmfulness to trade or to the level playing field, but harmfulness to the health of fish stocks and their role in ocean biodiversity and ecosystems. And I think this makes the WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies reached in June uh, sort of unique trade policy object and one that still sparks a lot of interrogations on how it might be implemented, with which effects. And questions are actually even more open that the agreement was a partial agreement and the new round of negotiations is now taking place to try and complement the first set of disciplines that was adopted uh, in June. So I really look forward to the, to the audience appreciation of this agreement and, and what, it might, uh, what it might achieve. But before going into that discussion, what I propose to do with this presentation is maybe to take a step back uh, to, to contextualize this agreement and look at why eliminating support that is harmful to fish stock is actually necessary and how it might be um, doable. Maybe one first uh, important element of context actually is clarifying what we are talking about when discussing um, fishery subsidies in this context. Um, as you all know, a number of subsidies definitions are used by different organizations and the WTO definition is actually relatively restrictive or at least the way it is interpreted by members is. So in a WTO negotiation context, um, subsidies refer to direct support to um, fishing companies and individuals and such support that is only offered to them. So this, for example, rules out subsidies that would be available to both fisheries and, agric and agriculture, for example, or subsidies that would be available to all maritime sectors. This also rules out other types of support, such as services to the fishery sectors, uh, like investment in infrastructure, for example, or payment for access to, to foreign waters. So that's important to keep in mind when you think of what the implications uh, might actually be. 
idea OECD, when we look at the impact of, of fisheries support and when we study that, we like to use a broader definition that also includes support to the sector as a, as a whole. So our database, um, the fisheries support estimate database, actually includes all types of policies that are targeted to, to fisheries. And recently, we also started looking into support that benefit fisheries, but without being uniquely targeted to fisheries, which we refer to as non-specific support that benefits fisheries. Uh, but we don't have much data on that, and it's still um, at an exploratory stage, I would say. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion, because I think it's really uh, quite an interesting area for future research. So how much are we, are we looking at, actually? <laughs> Well, after 20 years of negotiations, uh, it somehow remains hard to say. Uh, in principle, the WTO has a subsidies reporting mechanism, but members have not been very diligent about it. Um, you may have heard of rather large fishery subsidies numbers, like the 35 billion estimates of um, Professor Rashid Sumaila and colleagues, of which they believe 22 billion would be harmful. We tend to think this is on the high end, as it includes uh, a lot of estimates and policies, which uh, even at the OECD, we wouldn't uh, qualify as fisheries support, such as, for example, support to marine protected uh, areas. On our end, we collect data on support to fisheries directly from uh, governments, which gives us rather detailed and trusted data, but maybe uh, misses a few things, as the incentive to be fully transparent is not always there. Um, also, our database is not global. It covers about 40 countries, uh, OECD members, plus large fishing nations like China and Vietnam. Uh, but together, these countries accounted for 90% of global landings uh, in recent years. So we believe it still captures the vast majority of global uh, fisheries support. And that data tells us that fisheries um, support totaled um, just above 10 billion yearly, on average between 2018 and 2020, which represented about 11% of the value of landings over that period, down from about 14% um, between 2012 and 2014. So why not as high as the numbers I mentioned before? It's still a significant amount of money that has the potential to affect fishing incentives and fishers' decision, uh, especially as this support is not equally distributed um, across countries and across fisheries within countries. So on the right-hand side panel of this graph, you can see total support to fisheries in individual countries as a proportion of the value of lending, so the value generated by the, by the sector. Uh, it's limited to the top 30 uh, countries in the database for readability. And uh, I don't know if it's very readable, but um, I hope it's readable enough that you can see that there is a lot of variation across, um, across countries. <clears throat> that said, coming back to my previous point, the WTO is actually not focusing on these 10 billions, but only on a subset of those policies that are directed to individuals and companies. So typically um, on this graph, which shows a simple breakdown of fisheries support over recent years, um, the first turquoise uh, category is support to fisheries management and enforcement of fisheries rule. So something that you would not want to uh, discipline on the contrary, a spending that is seen to be beneficial to, to the sector. The second category, fuel, the red one, um, certainly falls under the WTO negotiation um, if it is specific. Um, and that's why we also want to look at non-specific support, which I will come back to later, uh, because we think that in some countries, uh, specific fuel support is actually the tree that hides the, the forest. So there may be a lot that needs to be looked at uh, outside, uh, outside specific support. Going back to the previous graph, if you now look at the left-hand side uh, panel, you can see the, the variation in policy mix and so in the nature of spending across country. And so you will see that not only some countries uh, spend much more than others in relative terms, but they also don't spend on the same, uh, on the same type of, uh, of support policies. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of variation in the policy mixes across, uh, across countries. Now, why is it that these negotiations and reforms more generally are taking forever? Of course, as always, uh, with trade policy, political economy considerations are taking a part in the story. And uh, one has to admit that not many trade agreements have been negotiated in the last 20 years. 
But there are also fundamental reasons that explain the fact that delineating uh, harmful fisheries support is actually a difficult um, task. From an empirical perspective, it's very difficult to isolate the impact of subsidies on fish stock health because establishing causality uh, is not easy. There is no natural experiment setup uh, that um, you know, comes to mind when you, want to, when you want to do that. And fish stock health is also affected by a range of um, natural phenomena and notably increasingly climate change. Uh, the influence of which on fish stocks is not necessarily always well understood. So ruling this out from um, the evolution in fish stock health is actually uh, very, uh, very difficult. What is more, observing fish stock health in itself is also difficult and costly. And information about subsidies themselves, such as who benefits, um, what uh, stocks beneficiaries actually harvest, how healthy those stocks are, all of these um, pieces of information that you would need for thorough analysis um, are very often uh, lacking. So the evidence base is not uh, as good as one would, uh, as one would hope. And all this um, actually also complicates the trade and socioeconomic uh, impact assessment of, of fishery subsidies, because not only you need to understand all the normal subsidies impact that you would observe in other sectors, but also the implications on stock health kick in in the medium to long term. So you could have subsidies that boost trade in the, in the short run until overfishing leads to decreasing stocks and then ultimately decreasing trade or no trade at all. So all of this is, uh, is, rather, is rather complex. However, a combination of modeling work and econometric impact measurements, um, which are all listed in our, in our report, if you would like a sort of review of literature on the, on the topic, points, all this literature points at a number of um, key factors in the relation between subsidies and fish stock health. And it's something that we have focused on at the OECD to try and summarize this factor in a framework that can help countries identify the support policies that present risk to fish stocks, uh, sort of guide uh, reforms, even though um, we don't have perfect uh, information. So those key factors that I just uh, mentioned include, of course, the nature and the design of support policies, that is the type of, of, of support, and whether it directly or indirectly affects fishing costs and benefits, and thus uh, fishing incentives, and the conditions that might um, restrict eligibility to, to subsidies. The initial health of fish stocks uh, harvested by the subsidized vessels also matter in that if a fish stock is underfished, there is scope for increased fishing pressure uh, from, the, from the subsidy without, without damage. That said, um, FAO estimates that less than 10% of global fish stocks are underfished. So this is more of a theoretical factor than a, than a factor that um, really shows up in, uh, in reality. And then finally um, comes the management of recipient fisheries, which is the most relevant mitigating factor, I would say, um, as there is indeed a lot of variation in management intensity or quality across fisheries, which means that the same subsidy will not have the same impact depending on who benefits and um, the context in which the, the subsidy operates. If anything like perfect management existed, no subsidy would be harmful to fish stocks because overfishing and illegal fishing would simply not be permitted. Um, at the other extreme, if there is no fisheries management at all, almost any type of subsidy would be risky because even if the incentive um, is small, it's totally um, unconstrained. So in the end, it, would, uh, it could result in, in overfishing. So this issue of management and how it plays out uh, in terms of um, determining the impact of subsidies has become central in the, in the fishery subsidies negotiation, which is also rather unusual because the WTO is not a fisheries management um, organization. And it raises a range of questions. Uh, first, with regards to equality, as fisheries management capacity is not equally distributed uh, around the globe. And also in terms of what is good management or good enough management, uh, and can we identify fisheries management features that would actually prove um, beneficial in, in mitigating the impact of subsidies in any, in any context, or is it um, really context specific? So just to 
give you a quick illustration of um, um, this variation in context. Uh, you can see on this slide the stock health status um, data that we collect from countries we work with at the OECD. It's meant to include all information that is available to these countries on the health of the fish stocks um, they harvest. Uh, and as you can see, there is both a lot of variation in terms of the health status of these stocks. So in some countries, a vast majority of stocks are considered to be healthy. In others, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the contrary. But you can also see um, wide variation in terms of availability of information. So in some countries, several hundreds of stocks are assessed and we know what their health status are. In other countries, only just a few fish stocks um, are, actually, uh, are actually assessed. So subsidies operate in very different contexts from that, um, from that perspective. So because governments are faced with all these elements of uncertainty on the nature of subsidies, how they operate, who benefits, which make it difficult to measure the impact of one particular uh, subsidy or even uh, make it difficult to anticipate what that impact uh, might be, we have developed this risk-based framework that tries to summarize the key parameters uh, at stake. So on the left hand um, kind of axis here, um, you have um, categories of policy support types in which um, support policy types are, are clustered according to whether they directly impact on fishing costs and benefits, that's the red category, or indirectly do so. Then the blue category at the bottom um, has no such implications and in fact, uh, potentially benefits to fish stock health. And the white category in between is the uncertain category, as these types of support could play both ways depending on, on design. And then on the bottom axis here, um, you have um, the mitigating factors that I, that I mentioned uh, before, which may lower the risk of encouraging unsustainable fishing uh, under certain conditions. So if management is perfect, if the stock is underfished, and if the policy design is really effective at directing uh, subsidies um, to those fisheries that are healthy and well-managed, then there is low risk of subsidizing uh, with, any type of, uh, with any type of support. And the further away you are from these ideal conditions, then the more um, the, the, the risk levels that you see here uh, apply to the to the policies uh, to the policies in place. And the idea is to use this as a sort of worst case scenario guide of ident for identifying the policies that, that, that present risks. So this is what we've done. We've applied um, the categories I just showed you to our fishery support estimate data. And we've tried to see how um, risk to fish stocks has evolved over time uh, on the basis of evolution in the policy, in the policy mix. Um, the good news is the evolution has been rather positive, uh, and this is notably thanks to a reform of fuel subsidies in China that saw large amounts of money uh, directed away from high-risk fuel support. But still, the high and medium uh, risk support uh, total more than 60% of total support to fisheries. So that's really high. The no risk policies only account for 20% of the total. So the scope for reform is actually still very, very significant, which is why this WTO negotiation is actually so important. Um, as before, you can see that variation in the risk profiles is also great uh, across countries, obviously, because they don't spend on the, on the same things. Um, and so this kind of uh, framework can also help uh, identify priorities from ref for reforms uh, when you combine uh, on the left the policy mix of individual countries and on the right their total support, which gives you an idea of where uh, vast amounts of money might be going to, um, to risky policies around the, around the world. Um, 
So circling back uh, to the to the WTO uh, agreement, is it going to help us accelerate a move away from risky support? Um, that's what I'd love to hear uh, from the from the audience uh, at the end. Uh, maybe for those who haven't read about the agreement uh, so far, a very quick uh, description of what it contains. Um, a first set of disciplines, the three most important being a prohibition of subsidies to IUU fishing and fishing related activities. Fishing related activities would be typically those um, vessels uh, that store and re re refrigerate fish uh, without fishing themselves. So fishing vessels just um, sort of pour fish into those, those big uh, tankers that then go, go back to port. Um, second, a prohibition of subsidies to the fishing of overfished stocks, so those that are already seen to be uh, overfished. And third, a prohibition of subsidies to fishing on the unregulated high seas, that's water outside uh, the EZ of any country that is not under um, the responsibility of any regional fisheries management organization or agreement. So basically, really unregulated um, areas of the, of the high seas. Then the agreement also calls for due restraint in subsidizing vessels that are not flagged to the subsidizing country. This idea is linked to the issue of IUU fishing as um, you know, a, a number of the regulations that apply to fishing depend on, the, on being on the flag country. So if you subsidize a, a vessel who is not flagged to your country, you don't have so much control over, over that fish, over that vessel, sorry. And then the last one is due restraint in subsidizing the fishing of stocks with an unknown health status. And uh, there's many stocks with an unknown status, so that's potentially uh, very meaningful. However, what due restraint means uh, and whether there will be any capacity for members to, um, to challenge that is something I think that remains to, um, to be seen. Then the agreement also has special and differential treatment. Um, Clauses that are actually uh, quite interesting in themselves. Maybe we can discuss that after the after the presentation. And there are extremely ambitious reporting obligations, which, if applied, should should open all sorts of new research avenues, as countries would ideally uh, have to report subsidies, but also the beneficiaries and the health stocks um, uh, that are the health of the stocks that are harvested by those beneficiaries. As you may have seen, we're very far from having this type of, this in of information at this stage. So it will be interesting to see how, um, how that goes. But in itself, it could have very beneficial impacts, if only by just um, creating information on where, where issues are and where efforts need to, um, to focus. Um, and I, as I was saying, there are now um, negotiating additional disciplines, uh, because you can see this doesn't cover uh, a prohibition of subsidies that encourage overfishing or overcapacity, which are part of the, of the WTO negotiation mandate and part of the SDG target. Um, so there's also a revisit clause in the agreement, uh, which says that the, the agreement would disappear, basically, if there is not a full agreement concluded within, within four years. But hopefully, we won't, uh, we won't get there. So maybe to finish and, and at the same time kickstart uh, the, the negotiation, I just wanted to outline uh, a few of the potentials that we see in this agreement and also some of the some of the challenges. So one could say that in a way this agreement already helps uh, countries move away from some of the most harmful types of support, like you know support to overfish stocks, clearly very harmful. So something good to to. Um, to avoid. Um, that said, implementation challenges already arise because uh, in theory, countries uh, are those who will say whether a stock is overfished or not. And so how that might play out uh, will be interesting to see. Also, as I just said, we're missing a number of disciplines that are still uh, being negotiated so that um, most harmful uh, types of support would be, would be actually covered. Um, I was saying also before um, the agreement should encourage better fisheries ma management, if only to continue being able to support the sector in unharmful ways. Uh, but what good enough management is to mitigate the potentially harmful impact of support will be a key question from that uh, from that perspective. Um, <clears throat> 
and then there's a, a number of other other potential and challenges that I see, but maybe I'm already over time, so we could uh, we could come back to uh, to those uh, to those later. Maybe I'll just flag the last one uh, on the bottom right of the screen, which is which is um, very contextual, but I think a key challenge for for fisheries uh, policymakers in the near future, uh, in the current context of um, you know, very high energy prices because of the geopolitical situation, there is of course a lot, a lot of pressure on fisheries policymakers to, to support either uh, you know, energy directly or the energy transition of the, of the fisheries sector. And what this means in terms of new support being introduced and whether we can do that in a non-harmful way is actually a, a very important question as um, you could have, for example, um, support that is beneficial from an emissions perspective as if you, know, you move to um, alternative fuels that would, be, that would be beneficial in terms of emissions, but it also means it lowers your, your cost of fishing it introduces new capital in the in the sector, and so the impact on fish stock health might actually um, be harmful. So um, I think we're going to see new policy trade-offs in the in the next few months that will be uh, very uh, very um, important to keep in mind and look at. Um, as Hannah said at the beginning, um, here are links to uh, everything we, we, we have on this topic, uh, the full report, all of our data sets are actually uh, publicly available in terms of subsidies, fish stock health and, and management, and then we have a couple of policy briefs that um, summarize some of our key messages, so I would uh, warmly invite you to, uh, to take a look at all this. And uh, yeah, that's that, that's it for me now. I very much look forward to the discussion and and the uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. That was uh, that was really great. So you covered a, a huge amount of territory there, and I really appreciate uh, the way that you went into the issues. Um, let me hand over to our discussant to get the ball rolling uh, on questions and comments. Um, let me add one word to Hannah's introduction, which is. Uh, that before Radhika was at the Commonwealth Secretariat, she was the Deputy Permanent Representative of Fiji to the WTO. Um, and the Pacific Island countries, of course, are countries for whom fisheries uh, matter in a relative sense more than most. So I know this is an issue that's uh, been very close to her and that she's worked on a lot. So uh, Radhika, let me hand over to you for your uh, discussing comments. Um. Thank you, thank you, Ben, for that uh, generous uh, introduction, uh, edition, and Claire. Thank you for your your presentation. I think it's uh, you know it, it's got a lot of information and something which I think all of us need to reflect on. Um, but uh, as as uh, Ben mentioned, um, I will try to provide some uh, additional insights uh, based on the uh, experience or from negotiations and also uh, from uh, from your presentation I note um, that the reference has been made from the fisheries review of uh, 2022 as well so I did have um, a bit of uh, time yes um, yesterday evening to just uh, see through the uh, the report. So what I will do first of all is uh, perhaps for the interest of uh, the audience provide some uh, more um, additions on the WTO text and perhaps uh, some areas where maybe um, researchers can explore more in relation to the ongoing uh, fishery subsidies uh, negotiations. So um, and then at the end I will try to just highlight like what should be the next thing in the text right what's next in the text so that's what I kind of um, have highlighted so of course we know uh, fisheries is one of the vital sectors for growth across economies and it comprises of 10 percent of uh, you no know, food security and livelihood which also is uh, something that is outlined in the OECD report but uh, I also understand that there's a lot of um, mandates and uh, that Claire rightly pointed out in the beginning of her presentation that has kind of led to these fishery subsidies negotiations. And one of the uh, elements is the SDG 14.6. Now, uh, when we, as uh, from coming from a developing country, LDC and SVE view, giving the broader global view, uh, in addition to the OECD uh, countries, um, the SDG has got three elements, which is social, uh, environmental and economics together, 
which I think uh, countries were looking to address uh, in relation to SDG 14.6. So one of the key things I think uh, countries need to also learn, I mean, or, or maybe reflect on rather, is how does this fishery sector impact the different uh, players in the fisheries resource market? So we would I would see that uh, in terms of the demanders and suppliers of fisheries resources. And each of the um, um, players have got different objectives in the market, right? So for instance, the suppliers of fisheries resources, I would categorize them as developing countries and of course the small states, for in example, in the Pacific region, right? We have what is known as the parties to the Nauru agreement and these are small countries, but they hold 80% of the global tuna supply. Yet these are countries that are not large vessel owners, but they have extreme large ex uh, exclusive economic zones. So these countries have the potential to develop their fishery sector in future in a sustainable manner. Then we have got the demanders of the fisheries resources in the market. I, I categorize them as the processors of fish and also the vessel owners. And in this, most of the developed and some developing countries already have the developed vessel capacity and some of them are even in a position to survive without subsidies because they have achieved that level of uh, development, right? And um, I think in 2017, we, uh, I did a paper which uh, outlines some of the these in, um, in what is known as fishery subsidies negotiations, the real catch. So, um, uh, and what kind of we want to ensure is that we have a, we have a subsidies agreement uh, on fisheries, which is workable. And we should learn from the history of uh, the discourse that is happening in the agreement on agriculture as well. Now, having said this, uh, uh, Claire rightly pointed out, of course, the illegal, unreported, unregulated uh, fishing is one of the key issues that is affecting the entire fish stocks, right? Uh, we, and then, of course, countries have really committed to uh, ensuring how do we combat this IUU issue. So the mis mismanagement of fisheries resources is one of the key uh, areas um, in the text as well. Now, the question is more on how do we build, more on um, building the capacity of developing countries, in particular the LDCs, the S S SVEs, in ensuring that they are able to properly regulate and properly report on the IUUs. And I understand in the fisheries text, um, I think in your last or second last slide, Claire, you rightly pointed out, there's some SDT uh, kind of um, uh, formulation in the text, but, um, and it's more to do with transition periods. But in my own personal view, this is not sufficient. If we are thinking of real solutions um, in uh, ensuring uh, we build the capacity of uh, these small countries, right? In particular, the SVEs and LDCs. Uh, though this has been already negotiated uh, in the in the text, I think part one, but maybe part two can kind of expand on this area, right? So what kind of capacity? Of course, uh, in re regulating and reporting, there should be provisions such as um, um, assistance in development of infrastructure, uh, maybe technology for better regulation, and also maybe um, more policy on and uh, also capacity uh, given to these countries uh, for regulation and reporting. Uh, and many, and this is not uh, a new uh, area because many of the fisheries agreements, again, going to the slide one, uh, I think, which Claire shows, showed that there are many agreements, right? So UNCLOS and fish stock agreements. These clause have special requirements for developing countries, which provide a list of areas of assistance. And even in the soft fishery, fisheries agreements, when I say soft, I mean the international plan of action, these things are provided. So maybe when our negotiators are thinking about how to be, uh, enhance the text, these would be some of the areas that they could uh, think of in relation to um, you know, subsidies and capacity as well. And um, so another thing is, uh, I also read the subsidies, uh, the fishery subsidies text, and it does mention about the provision of funding, but then of course it is voluntary funding. So, Though that is there, but 
the imbalance will exist if the special and differential treatment provisions are not expanded on and then the kinds of assistance are not clearly, de clearly defined for implementation purposes. And the developing countries and SVEs, as I've mentioned, are small fishery sector. So they are yet to develop their sector. So if negotiators play their cards well, they can um, ensure there's um, sustainability of the fish stocks and also there's capacity, the building that they can provide if they enhance the technical assistance uh, um, uh, uh, clause in the text by ensuring that they give meaningful and effective assistance to achieve sustainability. I've always been think. I always have this re reflection uh, when people, when our negotiators are mentioning about the issue of subsidies, right? Uh, and also the, the issue of what kinds of subsidies or disciplines to regulate. And Claire rightly pointed out, there's different baskets of subsidies, but again, we have to be mindful if we are looking at the entire WTO membership, that development is as rightly pointed, is not equally distributed. So what is true for one may not be true for another. And I know there were discussions about maybe I'm I'm not suggesting anything, but there were discussions previously about a listing approach of subsidies. But then again, uh, certain parameters need to be established, and also countries have to also maybe uh, the researchers on um, online who are interested in this can also research a bit further on how the trend of historical subsidy distribution has been in the developed and the developing countries because what the kind the certain kinds of subsidies that are now specific and being disciplined were once provided by these large vessel holders themselves so something to you know to reflect on and how then do you uh, ensure that the imbalance is kind of uh, negated and there's equal opportunity and balancing in the negotiations. Uh, so when from previous WTO negotiation experience, we also had the issue of the capacity of WTO in terms of its trade mandate versus that of its management, which I think in, in Claire's uh, last second last slide, she also mentioned that. So of course, there needs to be also close cooperation and coordination among institutions if we are really serious about uh, the fish stocks and in, from an environmental perspective. Now, one thing, there's something which I think is entirely missing in that text. Um, I think uh, th there's a lot, when we were doing the negotiations and even now when negotiations are happening, there's always a reference to a lot of fisheries um, uh, agreements or we, even in the soft or the mandated uh, um, agreements outside the WTO, but no one is talking about this international plan of action for capacity. And it will be good to have a discussion and countries need to actually uh, reflect on those developed countries that already have developed their vessel capacity and how they can now look into reducing it. So if you are more interested, um, and if you are a negotiator online, please go and read the IPOA capacity. You will, you might get some more insights on this. Um, and on subsidies and vessel capacity uh, of the developed countries, uh, there's a lot of um, literature on this. I might share a few of um, this information with uh, you know with Ben and and uh, to share with members, but I ha I just wanted to uh, uh, also comment on this OECD Fisheries Review Report. So I note that the review report it did some analysis on the capacity and but what it it can be further like maybe in your next review it can further deep dive into another level of assessment because. The review did uh, uh, the assessment of combined fleets of all countries and economy. But what would be good is instead of looking at the combined fleet, further assessment on the vessel size and capacity by country would provide a more um, granular uh, picture 
for example, uh, some countries may have few vessels, but the size of the vessel is large. For example, some have 70 meters and thus have more capacity. So for the interest of the audience, if you um, even now reference the OECD fish, fish test database, the fishing fleet um, also provides for the size of vessels by countries. So for interest, you can check that there are countries with vessel size of 30 meters and above, uh, 70 meters and above. And this is very important if we are going into discussions on capacity, because as a whole, at aggregate level, um, the analysis is um, covers all sides of the vessels, right? But if you are trying to discipline fishery subsidies, we know the large uh, contributors to the decline in fish stocks are those that kind of are massive mega vessels, right? So it would be good to have that level of analysis done and perhaps, uh, you know, that will feed into the fishery subsidies uh, negotiations. And this has always been something I've been reflecting on and it's still reflecting on is there's always this um, issue of what subsidies to discipline. Then again, you have to uh, think holistically on the socioeconomic objective of the country providing the subsidy and also the size of the maybe the fishery sector market, right? At aggregate level, maybe the information might show another picture. But if we look at pay capita or pay fishermen level at country, if we can go that level, we will get a more um, uh, deeper insight on uh, what kinds of subsidies are really harmful or what kinds of subsidies could be allowable and to what extent. Um, so with this, I would just like to end with some reflections on what's, what's next in the text, what should be some things which perhaps is for in research, um, researchers can explore more, or maybe when negotiators are negotiating. Of course, the expansion of the uh, special and differential treatment clause, where uh, assistance should be more defined in relation to proper regulation, reporting, and also there's a lot of discussions about uh, overfish stocks, but if you uh, see uh, the article 4.3 footnote 11, doing fisheries assessment, fish stock assessment in its own is a burdensome uh, on, um, on countries which are small states and as we uh, small states and also LDCs in relation to rebuilding stock level and biological sustainable level. Also notification and transparency is uh, great. Everyone needs that. But then this is uh, in the text, it is beyond the current Article 25 agreement on uh, subsidies and countervailing measures. And for notification, of course, countries were already challenged uh, in their notification process in Article 25 of S uh, SCM agreement. Now uh, requesting them for further um, um, notifications would, is definitely bad and some so capacity in this area under SDT expansion could be explored. And um, also the need for having this um, discussion on capacity, uh, disciplining vessel capacity, and maybe uh, countries can also look into the IPOA uh, capacity um, action plan, which is there. Uh, and then assess the disciplines based on the size of the fishing vessel and also the gross tonnage per country. So with I end my intervention here. Okay, thanks so much. Claire, I'm gonna turn it back to you both to respond to Radhika's comments. And I'm also gonna get another question uh, into the works if I can. So this is from uh, Yvonne who put it in the uh, Q&A box. And he's asking if there are specific restrictions on fishing methods. So for instance, are there, you know, particular disciplines that say, you know, you can't subsidize as much if the fishing method is particularly harmful to the to to stock health and all that sort of thing. So maybe when you respond to Radica, maybe you can also uh, comment on that as well. That'd be really great. Thanks Radhika for this very thorough uh, 
comments and for the additional question as well. Maybe I'll start with uh, backwards, you know, with one easy answer, uh, which was about this idea that it would be good to look at um, data on fleet capacity by country. It's not uh, necessarily discussed in the report because we uh, are constrained <laughs> in how long we can be in those reports. But on the website, we also have country notes uh, that actually display all the data we have by country. And so in those country notes, you can find uh, detailed data about fleet uh, capacity over time in every uh, distinct country. So that's one, one source of such information. Another one, which is in the report and which I think is really relevant to what you were saying, uh, Radhika, is we also try to look at support relative to fleet capacity, because the you know total total amounts of supports are of course very misleading. Uh, a large fleet may have large support, but it doesn't necessarily create huge incentives. Uh, so we also look at supports by uh, gross tonnage of, of fleet capacity, and I think that's something that. Um, we would like to explore even more uh, in the in the future. We also look at certain types of support by Fisher and others uh, by um, dollar of, of lending uh, of lending value. So all these measures give you um, a, a relative view of, of the amount of the yeah the, the size of support in different countries, and you will see that actually the top subsidizers are not the same in depending on how you look at this. So it also, I think, um, brings some context in the negotiation, because if you look at total support, China comes out everywhere, you know, uh, but rightly so, because they have a very large fleet. So, so it's important to actually, um, to actually look at that. Um, then going back to your second, uh, like the big, uh, the big topic in your in your intervention was this issue of special and differential treatment, and the sort of distributional uh, consequences of the of the of the agreement, which of course is really uh, key in this uh, in this discussion. One question that I've had on my mind, and I'm not sure it's been answered, um, you know, thoroughly, but I think it's really something that people should look into is you know what it's in the what's in the best interest of developing countries um, who depend on fisheries um is it more important for them to negotiate special and differential treatment that is more significant than what is already there or is it that actually large uh, developed fishing nations uh, are submitted to more stringent disciplines and i think the balance is is not necessarily easy to uh, easy to find but it's important to keep both in mind because if you just um, sort of fight for special and differential treatments uh, but sort of forget the main disciplines which will apply to your competitors you might actually be missing a lot of potential benefits from those uh, from those uh, agreements and from that perspective the delineation of subsidies that will be disciplined by the agreement is actually a really core issue so what about um, support to fish um, outside your EZ what about support to fish maybe in other countries EZ um, how stringent will be the, the you know the subsidies and the management sort of mitigation. If you're allowed to do anything with good management, that maybe the disciplines are not very strong. But if you're allowed to do only some things, if you have very good management and you have to demonstrate that, then we're talking about something uh, different that could have huge impact for for developing countries and given the capacity of developing countries to subsidize in the first place which tends to be low because there isn't that much public money to be spent um i think it really sort of um you know brings an interesting debate uh into the into the into the discussion as to what uh, developing countries can can gain from this uh from this uh, agreement. And then finally, just uh, to say that indeed there, the agreement also sets up a WTO fund that is supposed to help developing countries increase capacity, management capacity, not fishing capacity. <laughs> I think that's important to clarify. So it's there to help them manage their fisheries better, assess their stocks, and be in a position where you can subsidize potentially without, without any harm. So that's there. And a few countries have started to, uh, to give money to that fund. So I think it's the case of the US, Canada, Norway, and a couple of others. I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to um, forget anybody. Uh, so the fund is sort of uh, building up, and uh, hopefully, it will become a really interesting tool uh, in addition to the to the agreement itself. Thanks, Claire. I, I want to follow up with, with with one question, and it's a bit of a, a sort of meta question. Um, so, Claire, going back in time, and I'm not going to embarrass us by saying how far this is. 
you and I were both grad students and something we were working on was another commodity where subsidization was a serious issue, development was a serious issue, environmental sustainability was a serious issue. And there were a group of countries who tried to carve it out as a separate uh, issue to discuss at WTO. And indeed, I believe it is it still comes up for discussion, but they have not succeeded in having an agreement or anything uh, even close to that. Of course, I'm talking about cotton. So you mentioned political economy right at the beginning of the talk. What makes the difference between cotton on the one hand, where you've got a group of developing countries, uh, Brazil even went to dispute settlement about it, won a case against the United States. I mean, all this kind of stuff happened, yet we still have uh, the level of cotton subsidies that we have. On the other hand, we have fisheries where there's now a dedicated agreement to try and do something about it. And I think you've set up really well uh, what all the considerations are that go into that. So how did we get to such different outcomes? That's a really tough question. Do you want to start, Radhika, or I can, I can say what I think, but I, I really don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure. I have the explanation. Um... I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think it, it, it's more to when you when you are in a negotiating environment. You know, it's it's more the negotiators. It's more what the country wanted at that time. More about information uh, availability and things, and perhaps you know, cotton had only like C four, right? Um, but uh, with the like sea for interest, but uh, with fisheries, it's uh, many countries, right? More than hundred. So of course, the the difference in terms of what the outcomes of the negotiations uh, is, I, in my opinion, as a negotiator, will definitely vary. So, but how? Yeah, and it's still on the table, right? Because even <laughs> even cotton. Cotton, if you look at, uh, I mean, Ben is an expert in global value chains and all those things. So you know the importance of cotton in the entire value chain, right? It's not just about clothes, it's about so many other things. So it's, um, and then of course, the agreement on agriculture, which countries are still negotiating and um, on certain aspects. Um, if, if, if you are um, sort of mirroring what what is what in in a from a negotiator perspective what we found out back then when we were negotiating is the same issue of specific and non specific subsidies but then in uh, in um, ag agreement on agriculture there was green box and blue and amber box right and there was box shifting that happened of course in in those times there's several papers out there that countries that already provided the specific subsidies exhausted it and of course then they brought it to the developing countries to kind of um, discipline now we can um, in the fisheries subsidies negotiation that's where the learning comes into play where if we are um, 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 uh, well read in terms of what the uh, text is saying uh, it is something to that effect I think there's a lot of um, debates at the moment where the for developing countries, specific subsidies is still sensitive in most cases because they're developing their sector. For developed countries, historically they've given those subsidies and now they have phased it out. So for them, um, it's easier to do reforms in the fishery sector, right? Having said that, it's not about, uh, it's not really about um, harming the fish stock, right? So there's a market access agenda that we, we clearly see as well. In, in relation to sustainability. And uh, one more thing I would want to throw in this as well is everyone is talking about the ultimate goal is to ensure that fish stocks are healthy, right, from this. And subsidies is not the panacea to kind of everything, right? There's climate change, there's other variables that needs to be taken into account. I'm not against the agreement, but it is just food for thought <laughs> for, for everyone, yeah? I think we've just established. So one of one of the points of TPRF is that we're a research forum. Um, so if we've just given a grad student in the audience a nice idea for a research paper, then uh, that that's mission accomplished. When I asked the question, I had no idea what the answer was. So thank you very much for all of those uh, points. I think we've 
we, we've made a great start. I, I think, uh, you know, this is an area where there's obviously been um, some important progress recently. So it's great to get up to date on that. Um, I think that that's really useful uh, for everyone who's been here. And of course, something that we like to do as part of our organization is to have different perspectives. So, you know, having Claire talking about this from um, a research and policy perspective, and then getting uh, also a negotiator perspective on top of that, I think gave a really interesting uh, uh, conversation in this area. So let me thank uh, both Claire and Radhika for their time today. We really appreciate uh, the fact that you were willing to uh, come and talk to us on the webinar. Let me thank my co-host Hannah, uh, as always, uh, for uh, everything that she does to make this series possible. And I'll just give a quick plug for our next webinar, which is going to be on June 29, and we'll be talking about special economic zones. Um, so keep your uh, keep your eyes peeled. You'll be getting emails. Uh, there will be LinkedIn posts and tweets and all the rest letting you know um, about the details. And of course, we'd love to see as many people there as possible. So thanks everyone uh, for being with us today and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you so much. And thank you, Radhika, for making my job so easy. My question is always, what's the, what's the research? And you already did that. So thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Bye. <laughs> and okay. take a look at the OECD data sets and policy briefs. Uh, and connect. And yes, somebody was asking if the presentations would be posted and if Claire is willing to give it up, we'll put it out on the website. Thank you so very Thanks. much. See you all. Next Thanks time. everyone. Bye.